I like that intro. Hi. <laughs> we are all here, all assembled. Hello. Okay. You guys, I feel like, have been talking about this movie a lot in the preparation for people to get a chance to see it. But what has it been like to be able to actually have the conversations about it afterwards? What is something that someone picked up on that you were particularly like, yes, you get it? Um, Julia, I'm going to ask that to you first. Well, it was a conversation I had today, so that'll that'll be a good place to start. But uh, I loved, I was talking to Roger Gerling this morning, and he was talking about how at the beginning of the film, Jean can't, you know, isn't even allowed to drive the car, and by the end of the film, she's in the driver's seat. And cars in general are such an important part of 70s films, and so we really wanted to explore, you know, we're so used to seeing men in the driver's seat of those cars, and men trying to catch each other in those car chases. And so I love that, you know, our car chase has Marcia Stephanie Blake driving the car and the film ends with Rachel Brosnahan driving them to safety. So. Also, can we just talk about that for a second? Getting to have this like really intense high speed car chase in the scene. How much fun was that for you guys to get to like be behind the wheel? Marcia Stephanie? I mean, so it's, you know, my fantasy of being a movie, of course in a movie, a movie star, come true. However, <laughs> I'm a New Yorker, so I'm not a natural driver by any means, and definitely not cars this big or this kind of unwieldy. And so I was petrified, but then once I got into it, I really was into it. There was one day, though, where, uh, Julia, I don't know if you remember, where I kept turning. I was supposed to be turning right or left. Okay. <laughs> And I was turning the complete opposite direction of where I was, you know, the, sort of the CGI was supposed to take me. And I was so into it. And I was just like, oh. <laughs> and then Julia, in her, she's so sweet. She just kind of comes, she goes, so it looks like my, it looks like you're turning. <laughs> right? You really uh, should, like, if you look on the screen, you're really supposed to be making a very, like, very clear left turn. And I was like, all right. I was just so into it. <laughs> But yeah, I was, <laughs> That's I, what I'm there for. I was also mm -hmm. extremely excited, and I had the most gentle director to guide me. It was just a crash course in stunt driving, stunt driving 101. But I also had, like, the most amazing real actual stunt driver. Oh, my God. God. Brianna. She's amazing. So amazing. She really did all the work. <laughs> she's I mean, phenomenal. Yeah. And is very young. I feel like she's, like, in her early 20s, and it's, yeah, like, isn't one she, like, best in the or world. Something? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. There's more kick ass, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that, women behind I'm Your Woman. Um, Rachel, for you, what was something that, you know, in these conversations and all of these Twitter chats and things um, that you've been having with people is something that you were like, yeah, they saw what you're going for? You know, the things that I've meant the most have actually been the private messages that I've received from women who feel seen in this film in a way that I think surprised them. You know, it, it is a 1970s crime drama, uh, and it does come with a lot of those big set pieces, like the car chases that we've been discussing, but it's also, a, it's deeply rooted in this character study of this woman, Jean, and, and I know that we've all talked about this so much, but it recognizes and, and honors the quiet women who have struggled with experiences of motherhood in, in very vastly different ways. Um, this is a woman who doesn't immediately connect with this child that's come into her life in a really unexpected way. And so much of her own journey towards recognizing, towards recognizing her own capability and her own power is through this relationship with this child. And I've received a number of messages from women who felt really moved by seeing this woman's journey and her internal life play out on screen in a way that I think made them feel more powerful. And that those, those stories have been incredibly moving to hear and to read about. And before we go on to the next question, Marsha and Stephanie, that question again to you as well. You know, this is something small, but it's something someone brought up recently, and it was about the relationship that's formed. Because we talk about the baby and Jean and, you know, um, or Jean and Terry, or Callie and, and Jean, but the relationship between Paul and Harry, mm -hmm. and someone said something to me about it, and how, you know, at the uh, at the end of, uh, I have people, people have seen the film at this point, I think, um, but at the end of the film, we realize they're actually 
related. And so um, just that, that, watching that develop and, and how it ends is really a beautiful thing and wondering where it's going to go and how it's going to you know, get talked about or explored. Someone brought that to my attention the other day, and I was like, you know, that's, that's so interesting because I, I never really think about it. But, yeah, I want to rewatch the film again and again and kind of just track that a little bit more, too, because they are both such That is an interesting relationship because I, I, I realize I haven't explored that one with you guys either. So, Julia, what is what is your take on that and, and seeing people kind of pick up on, on that one, the two half-brothers, half, kind of? And it's funny because there was actually a line in the film that we ended yeah. up cutting because of the emotional momentum of the end sequence. We just, it, it didn't need as many words as we had shot. Um, but there was a moment where Jean tells Paul, this is your brother. Um, but, you know, their fate, like on the day, their faces were doing all of the work that a writer could only dream of doing. My my favorite, probably my favorite moment in the movie is um, at the end, uh, Jean Rachel puts Harry the baby in. Paul, who's played by Damari Parks, who he'd never been in a movie before, and my goodness, he did such a beautiful job. Um, Gene puts Harry in Paul's lap, and Harry, the baby playing the part of Harry, cried. And then he turns and he looks at Damari and stops crying. And it's my favorite moment in the movie because it's just, it's, you know, you write that these two characters are brothers, and everybody figures that out by the end of the movie. And then those two children just living their lives create the most beautiful version of what that ultimately means that I could ever have hoped for. And that was part of, that's part of why I love working with kids. And, and this was my first time with, a, I, I had a baby in my movie Fast Color, but only for um, a couple scenes. This is my first time working with a baby in the, you know, most of the movie. And I just loved it because it just kept, we've all talked about this so much, but like it just kept us so honest and so present which is something that can be really hard to do on a film set when there's the pressure of time and safety and money and just everything. And like just all of that preparation and all of that professionalism <laughs> goes out the window when you get to watch. I think I stayed behind after we shot that at lunch and watched that take like six times because I just couldn't believe that it existed. We watched it in the moment before we yeah. shot another take. I mean, I think I was behind the monitor and we were all just like, I can't <laughs> believe that that happened on camera. I mean, that is the magic of having a movie like this where, you know, it is so, in, in so many ways, just like personal and has all of these different like personal elements to it. And just these things that kind of came together in that magic sense. What would you say was the most challenging scene to pull off on the day or something that when you were expecting a production, you were like, okay, I don't know how we're going to do this one. And then it just happened. Well, Marcia Stephanie, you said a really good one the other day that I had actually forgotten about, probably, you know, shoved out of memory, but we have that beautiful scene together, Jean and Terry, where Terry really opens up for the first time. And it's such a gorgeous scene. And, and I know like as an actor and as a producer and as someone who loved that scene in the script, I was so excited to see Marcia Stephanie do it, to do it with her. Um, and, uh, there was a bus, like seven buses. Every bus in the city <laughs> drove past that the window of oh, that okay. house. It gets <laughs> worse. Because every 10 seconds, there was another bus coming. And it was a talking bus. Yes. Yeah. It was like, the doors are opening. And, 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 the door, and like, you know. The next started. stop is. Yeah. You were just like. The hydraulics that lower the thing. And it's like. I like how I just refer to it as a talking bus, like it's on Apple Live and a Pixar bus. Anyway, yeah. you know what I meant. Yeah. That's was... something that you would have thought would be difficult. It's just two people talking in a hotel room. Turned out to be one of the toughest days. <laughs> something you never, it's always stuff like that, though. It's like the scenes that keep you up at night, the scenes that you worry so much about and feel so fundamental to the audience's understanding of the film. And those are always the scenes that somehow just pour out of you and that, that everything magically aligns on. And it's those tiny moments, those one eighth of page scenes that just end up shooting for four hours or, you know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, well, I remember 
Oh, oh, sorry. Go, no, no, you go ahead. I wonder if we're about to say the same thing, but I was going to say there was a scene in the film before Jean speaks about, um, or before Jean realizes, thanks to Cal, that she actually has bonded with this child more than she had recognized. We'd been trying to shoot that scene that was going to be a part of the movie <laughs> uh, before, you know, uh, before then and had just not been able to get it. It literally is just a scene of a non-crying baby and Jean singing and man, we, we tried and tried and tried. Well, he was asleep. Oh yeah, he fell asleep. He was supposed <laughs> to laugh and he fell asleep. And then he was crying the other day. We tried on multiple days to get that scene and who knew that that would also be one of the hardest things to get. But it ended up making the movie better. I suppose it's always those things where you have to adjust and you have to rethink and rework in the moment that end up adding these extra layers to the film that you never could have expected. And what I was going to say was that it's so funny because in prep, I remember thinking the car chase and the shootout and the car crash and the shootout at the nightclub would be the hardest things to shoot. But because they're the hardest things to shoot, you prepare them the most. Yeah. So with our with our stunt team and our special effects team and our VFX team and our art department and our actors and our stunt doubles, like we're preparing for weeks for that stuff. And so on the day, it's like effortless. Like the stuff that I thought was going to be the, the most challenging to shoot ended up being the easiest. And then the hardest thing to shoot was a, sh a shot of a sleeping baby. That was probably the hardest thing to get in the movie. It looks like the easiest, right? You watch these two cars collide in the air and crash. And it's amazing that we got that. But we got that because of all of the work of so many people to get it right. And then we could not get the baby to, to sleep. fall asleep when you need In its costume, baby. on the set. <laughs> like... It's just, it, it's, it's so funny what, it's a good lesson that like the thing you think is going to be the hardest can be the easiest and the thing that you think is going to be the easiest can be the hardest. I have that incredible video, which is one of my favorite pieces of behind the scenes footage of we finally did get the baby to sleep in the diner and just needed this one really quick shot, but it involved a handoff. Like it involved this, it involved the baby's wonderful mom, Caitlin, handing him to me asleep. Because he'd fallen asleep in her arms. Because he right. fell asleep in her arms, and we were like, oh, God. And it's Julia. There's this amazing video of everyone, all of these, like, you know, gruff grips and electrics, like, tiptoeing around the set, and Julia going, <laughs> and everyone's, like, holding their breath. <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. Nobody move. Nobody breathe. We have, we've got one shot at this, everybody. <laughs> and we got it. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. You got it, and that really is the magic of the moment. What was the first scene that you wrote of this film? The closet scene with Jimmy and Jean, because that where he sends her off. Um, that was the one of the direct references to Michael Mann's Thief, but that scene takes place between um, Frank and Jesse, who is... Uh, who are married. In our version, we had Eddie did the husband disappear and had one of his guys come take care of his business. Um, but that was the first scene that we wrote was our reimagining of that scene that is towards the end of Thief, but for us, it's towards the beginning of Norman. It, it kicks this off in, in the direction of which that, you know, that's kind of the, the brilliant thing about this movie and I think what everyone has turned to and loved so much is the general idea that we are getting to follow these characters and learn more about these characters that in typical 70s films we haven't gotten to know a bit about. So I'm going to ask you ladies, I know you've talked about it before, but when you look at what you were able to explore with, with Jean and with Terry, um, what do you feel like is the, maybe too lofty, but what is like the legacy of a character like this and of getting to explore um, these characters? Uh, Marcia Stephanie, I'll start with you. Um, for me, it was the idea that Terry has found normalcy after um, whatever she went through with Eddie. And so, it, well, there's the before, right? There's all this life that she has. They call her a firecracker. So in my imagination, Terry maybe did know about the business, maybe somehow was involved in the business, and then it got too much for her. And then she was like, I have to leave when she found out what her husband really, really did she's out but there's something about him calling her a firecracker that i feel like there's there's a, a texture to that that um maybe she's not as calm and as 
as chill as when we first meet her. So I love that idea that that's all like sort of bubbling under her underneath um, Terry's surface. But then this idea that there is now, before they enter Jean's world again, there is this black family. They are living a very normal life. They are raising their son to be a good person and to go not to go to school. They they are, they both have jobs. No one's on drugs. No one's in jail. No one, you know. It's a, it's a, it's the idea, which sounds just, of course, but for a lot of black characters, a lot of people I've played, we don't get to be normal. We don't get to imagine a life that is just living. We don't get to imagine the American dream in, in that way, in a way that is actually like just regular. Um, and so I love that that is there in the film even though we're meeting them at a sort of a different time in their lives now when they come back into Jean's life. But we get that that's what you have. And that you have two black people on film who are in love, which, I mean, and you know, that's not, unless there's like heavy drama associated with it or what have you, like, you don't get to see two people who are just simply in love. Um, and so, yeah, there's so many things about just Cal and, and, and Terry and Paul and the fact that the, Cal's dad, too, comes in and he, too, is like a very calm and chill person. It seems like he was a great dad and all of these things that we, it, it, it shouldn't be a revolutionary, but, but it is, <laughs> you know? It's strange sometimes that the revolutionary thing is in just presenting the normalcy. Oh, normalcy. Oh, so well said. Rachel, I will, I, I will, before we turn over to questions, I will ask you the same, you know, the legacy of this character and getting to uh, portray Jean. I feel like it, it can't really be said much better than how beautifully Marcia Stephanie said it, but piggybacking off of that, the idea that, um, that ordinary women's stories are worth telling and that are worth centering. Most women are ordinary. Most people don't decide or desire to change. And stories, of, you know, there are some people who, who it feels like came out of the womb ready to change the world and break the glass ceiling. But most people who change and most people who change the world change it because something extraordinary happened to them that, that forced them outside of themselves and outside of their lives. And I'm so grateful to filmmakers like Julia who recognize that, who recognize that, that not only are these stories valuable, but they're actually really important. And that um, there's so many more people who deserve to have their stories told and who deserve to see themselves on screen in a way that, as Marcia Stephanie said, shouldn't be radical anymore, but somehow still is. Guys, it only took six conversations, but you finally made me cry. <laughs> you crying? Oh my God. <laughs> That just like the way you all just said that just really got me and it's so true and maybe it's maybe it's months and months of us all being like isolated and disconnected and how much I miss you guys and it's just it's true like we're so I like I feel so privileged to get to tell stories about people who deserve to have their story told but for so many decades we're basically sent the message that they didn't matter because their story didn't matter I um in, in getting to a couple of the questions here, there is one starting for you, Julia. Um, what was... <laughs> Actually, you know what? I'm going to give you a seat. <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. Go no, ahead. No, go no, ahead. Don't go give ahead. her a second. Okay. <laughs> um, what, uh, what was the... This is from Noel. Um, or Noel. I'm Hi, so Noel. sorry. Hi, Noel. <laughs> what was the most what was the singular most challenging scene to translate from script to scene for you as writer director? I think I think it was probably and it's funny because we haven't really talked about this scene sequence scene sequence much. Um but the um the sequence where because what you always have in the 70s crime drama right is the car chase and the crash or whatever and then like I don't know the guy gets away 
and like all the like regular people have to you know the people on the street or whatever have to like deal with the mess and like the cops show up and all of that what I wanted to do was have as much as like it was really fun and exciting to shoot the car chase and then to find a way to show it from Gene's emotional psychological perspective and Terry and Cal's as well um the sequence that was the most important to me was actually the aftermath of the crash and how Gene you know makes the decision to turn the car around and go back and save her new friends and her who have ultimately kind of become her new family and her new community and I I like <laughs> in theory I feel like I was like like you know, when you're in that situation, we always say, like, a mother could lift a car up if her child was underneath it. You know, you'd find that superhuman physical strength. And so I just love this idea of after everything she's been through, she has literally been, like, wrung out and, like, hung out to dry. She's so, she hasn't slept in days. Like, she's so exhausted. She's so traumatized. Like, she would find strength to lift these bodies um, and, take you know, and, like, get everybody out of there. And I love that idea in theory on the page and everything, but then, like, you know, this girl here, (laughs) those bodies, and again, Alan D'Antoni, most incredible stunt coordinator, because he's talented and prepared, but also because he cares so much about every single person's comfort as well as safety, like emotional and psychological safety as well as physical safety. And it was like, it was a really hard night. Like, we had to shoot all of that in one night, and our special effects team, God love them, really struggled with getting the cars to transition between the crash and the aftermath, because you have to remove certain things for safety for the actors, you have to secure the car, like, there's a bunch of stuff you have to do. So we really didn't have a lot of time to shoot it. And man, I just, like, what these women had to do physically and figure out physically to do that, because there is no visual effects there are no special effects like that is something that just and it was so important to all of us that it be authentic that she really be lifting and moving those bodies um and i i I watched that sequence and i just i can't believe that we actually pulled it off i also love that in that because marcia stephanie and and arinze were i mean and, and you know like actors know how hard this is but were in that car playing sort of like dead and injured for as long as it took us to figure out those physical challenges outside of that car, it's freezing, you know, like, and and you get colder when you don't move. And then I also love that moment, that same moment you described for Marsha Stephanie, where like, you know, we were all just in a car accident and Marsha Stephanie, you know, Terry is injured so much more than Jean and still finds that strength to lift cow because it's not an option and the the piece of that where they are figuring out how to move him together um is one of my favorite pieces of this film but also you know we're both March 70 how tall are you (laughs) I know we're like the same size he is a tall man he is a tall man I was picking up Cal or Terry was trying to get Cal out of the car with Gene Gene had to pick up those men who were laying outside of the car. Inside the other car that she gets away with, she has to move them. Then she has to come back and then move the dead guys out of the way. And Rachel, these were not, they weren't stuffed bodies. These were. No, they were real men. They were big men. (laughs) Frozen ground. It was one of the coldest Very patient men. That we did it that night. It was one of the coldest days in in, in Pittsburgh. It was. It was freezing cold. Everything was frozen. The men who lay on the ground, I know, had to be lay there still for however long. It had to be take after take of Rachel dragging them across. I mean, it was intense. But I feel like things like that just make you feel closer to the people you're with. Because if you go through something like that, you're just like, we could do anything, you guys. Like everything else is easy after that night. You know what I mean? <laughs> And it, and it comes off on screen, too, because when you do think about that, you're used to the idea that, like, oh, it was totally easy. They were just able to do it and get away, but not in a way where it looked labored, ladies. But it did look like real people, what you would do in that situation. Well, you, can't, you can't fake yeah. that, you know? Like, or I wouldn't want to even if you could, and it's the same reason we had a real baby in 
you know, 80% of the movie, I think we used a prop baby for like two scenes, is that like there's just no um, substitute for the real thing. Like you really feel them moving those bodies and having to clean up the mess that these men have created for them and just like throwing out the trash, you know, and like moving on together. And I think, and going back to the idea that, again, these are normal women. These aren't superhero women. They didn't go train in some boot camp to prepare them for this life. These are regular women. So if you have these two regular five, two, five, three women, <laughs> need to be a bit more than a hundred pounds, <laughs> like what is it really like? And that's what it, it was real, you know? And we almost dropped a Rinse, but thankfully we didn't. <laughs> Just once. <laughs> <laughs> the untold stories finally come out. Yeah, he's a big guy, and that dead weight was, uh, we got a real workout. <laughs> um, our next question comes from Gino, and it is for Rachel. Um, greetings from your birth city as well. Uh, what was the most surprising thing that you learned as a producer? Hi, Gino. Hi, birth city. Um, uh, I think it was really just a, I mean, I've had the great privilege of working for the last couple of years with one of the greatest crews in the business on Marvel's Mrs. Basil. I mean, I have learned so much from being able to watch this team work every day and achieve the impossible on a daily basis. It's been so inspiring. As a producer, I think I had the I had the realization of just how late in the process actors normally enter the picture. The script is fully cooked, so many of these production decisions have already been made, and we have it so easy. We just show up and say our lines, and if you get to work with extraordinarily talented people, there's so little you have to do because the world has been built for you. You know, you have these these props that add to your experience and your performance. Um, but I think it just it gave me a like, newfound respect for how much happens before we enter the picture and how how much all these talented people have to come together as a team and how many months of work they've already put in before we even arrive. And also to piggyback off of that, how much that enriches one's performance as an actor to be able to spend that much time with a character in conversation with the writers and the director um, and to get to see the process of this person's world being built was I, I, I expected to struggle a lot wearing the two hats and I, I hadn't really considered how much they could help each other um, I think as an actor I was surprised by uh, by how helpful it was to be able to view things from an actor's perspective Um, for example, I had expected to feel like I had anything to offer as a first time producer. And uh, yeah, it, it's been a, there's been so many surprises that have been so wonderful and really welcome. And I, I've learned more than I ever could have imagined from working with this incredible team. That actually leads me in a perfect segue to the next question, which was from Gabriel. Um, and it's both for uh, Rachel and Marcia Stephanie. What was the first meeting that you had with Julia about the film? And a little shout out to Julia. Um, Gabriel loves fast color. Oh, thanks. Oh, I love fast color too. Uh, <laughs> I um, Stephanie, I'll have you go first, please. I'll go first. Um, so I had a Skype meeting with Julia, um, which was interesting on so many levels. I think I was traveling, so I wasn't even home. home running from room to room in my in-laws house trying to find the Wi-Fi. I had to use Skype and I was like, who is this? Why is, why are we doing Skype? Because I had to use Skype. I had to use FaceTime. I didn't even use why did we Skype? Skype? I was like, Skype? Wait, are you in England? She's like, I'm in LA. I was like, why are we on Skype? <laughs> why can't we FaceTime? Um, but yeah, I and so I had this Skype session. Well, not even a session. It was a conversation because we ended up, I think, mostly talking about our lives and our kids. We were both somewhere where our kids were very, very close. I think I got to meet your son. Yeah, that's time. right. Our son came and, and yeah, I we had this. I had this wonderful conversation with this mom across the country about life and our families and 
sort of about the film, but not totally. And I, I remember getting off the phone and being like, I just I just like her. I just want to hang out with her. I think we can be friends. And then and then I was like, oh right, that, that might have been. I, I, I don't know if that was an audition. I, like I didn't know what to even call it because it didn't feel like any of that. It didn't feel like work. It felt like I had this really great conversation with this great woman. And then I reminded myself that she had written a script that I really loved, and and she sent me um, Fast Color, and she sent me Miss Stevens, and I, I, you know, talked to other friends about her, and then to actually have this wonderful conversation with her, I totally was just like sold. I so wanted to work with her. But yeah, I secretly just make movies so that I can be friends with people. I think. <laughs> 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 instrumental 
for actors and the creation of characters. And, and with, you know, I can speak to Jean's journey, but um, Natalie O'Brien in particular, she is such a fantastic storyteller and had so beautifully thought out the evolution of Jean's journey through what she looked like and through what she chose to look like versus what she had to look like because circumstances had changed. And there's a couple of stages in between. Um, and all of those clothes felt so different to wear. And we talked about that a lot as we were picking Jean's outfits out that, you know, when we first meet her, she's, she's been cut straight out of the 1970s fashion magazine and, but it's, but it's empty, you know, it isn't necessarily her. She doesn't really know who she is. These are lavish, you know, this robe is a lavish gift that's been given to her. And then when she's on the run, she has nothing but the clothes on her back and this bag full of money and a baby um and they go to a bobby mart and buy these you know clothes off the rack but jean still picks them uh and then you know she arrives at the cabin and is wearing other people's clothes is wearing probably terry's clothes and art's clothes even and and cal's clothes and um and that uh that evolution was the conversations about the evolution with natalie taught me a lot and actually putting those clothes on really changed the way that I as Jean moved through space and I just I'm, I'm so grateful for that collaboration and Natalie is um she's very insightful and she also understands that I think what you don't always get like she she understands that for actors sometimes you putting the clothes on really solidifies for you what your character is yeah. um uh, I had a lot of conversations with her. For me, it's always the shoes. So I had a lot of conversations with her about the shoes, and she listened to me, and she heard me, and she got what I wanted, and she figured out what I was trying to convey. But also, there's something that a friend of mine pointed out, which I guess I, I knew sort of in the back of my mind, but my friend who saw the film brought it to the forefront. And she said, it's funny how uh, Terry is this very tough exterior, um, and she's and she's herself to the world is very she's a little walled off and out of safety when she when Jean meets her she has definitely a wall up but my friend said but all your clothes said exactly the opposite of that <laughs> she was like all your clothes were so warm and cozy and comfortable and everything you had on at the at the um, cottage were completely conveying like she meets me and I have my, like like my city clothes on right so there's a little bit of an exterior there but like the clothes that I end up wearing while we're at the cabin, all welcoming. It's all like, come sit in my lap for me, right? Uh, and then when I go back to the life that I used to have, where we have to go out and get the clothes that we get for the club and all of that, then you see like this, again, this exterior that is very um, tailored and cut and, and leathers and, and denims. And it's like a completely different person again, but you get the feeling that she is all of these things. And like Jean, there's a bug that I didn't, I didn't notice that, and nor should I. Um, I don't until someone else pointed it out to me, and I was like, oh, oh, that's that's so cool. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of questions in here too about the transformation of these women throughout the story, um, and in particular, um, there's a couple of questions in here about. Uh, about Jean learning how to fire the gun and learning how to physically defend herself in that way. Um, William McCutty asked if, Rachel, this was your first time firing a gun, but also um, Olkar asks here about how he, how this film is an exploration of motherhood and her, her finding her motherhood during this very dangerous, like physically dangerous time for Jean. Um, how... Julia, did you and Jordan also um, explore all the options for Jean to help her um, overcome these struggles that she had to face over the run and on the run and the physical dangers? I think part of wanting to put a, a woman at the center of one of these movies was wanting to up the stakes even further by having her also be not not just a woman but also a mother. And how there's nothing more. I, I I often joke that like I end up writing my worst nightmares into my scripts as a form of therapy. <laughs> like it's an exercise, like exercising those things. 
um, like I used to have this terrible fear of home invasion and then I wrote this film The Keeping Room which is the whole thing is a home invasion there's also a home invasion in, in this movie and I don't I'm not afraid of that anymore um, it helps uh, but I, you know there's nothing more terrifying than when you have this helpless you're, you're in a dangerous situation but then on top of that you have this completely helpless being who can make a lot of noise at any moment, who needs to eat when they need to eat, who needs their diaper changed when they need their diaper changed. Much like a baby doesn't know it's in a movie, like a baby doesn't know it's in a dangerous scenario. It doesn't know that there are men after him and his mother. And so we just love the idea of, you know, it, it's scary enough being a new parent. And there's enough uncertainty in new parenthood when you're not on the run. And so like, what, what would that be like? What would it be like setting Jean in that position as she's navigating this whole new world that she's in. And then, of course, in in the prep period for the film, we went through with our whole crew um, every instance that we would have the real baby and every instance that we would have the prop baby and how we would shoot any stunts and set pieces around shots of the real baby and the, the prop baby. If you look at the movie carefully, you can kind of like, I think editorially it works really well, and in the moment it feels like the babies, like the, like our real actor babies are in dangerous situations, but they never once were. And a lot of the crying is put in in post. There are times when he's totally fine and we're pretending that he's crying. But you had plenty of audio to work with. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Rachel, how did you... And, any, oh, and one other thing I'll say is, like, any time we were shooting something where he was really crying... The moment I said cut and like, you know, Rachel could turn him back around or hand him to his mom, he stopped crying. And I, I would always say to their mom, like, anytime he doesn't stop crying, we're not shooting any more takes. Yeah. Because babies, the thing, like, babies just cry. That's how they talk, you know? It doesn't always mean that, like, something's wrong. It's just how they communicate. But we were, I mean, that was like, as, as, a, as a mom and as all people who care deeply about the safety and well-being of children, that was something that we were constantly that was our not like number one forget the movie forget the studio like our number one priority was their well-being and rachel how did you look at that evolution for Jean, and in particular that idea of you know when, when the gun gets involved when she realizes like okay now now it's beyond the point of like i need other people to protect me i have to learn how to protect myself in this way. yeah i love that it feels it felt real on the page in a way that I hadn't seen before in a genre like this one that involves quite a lot of action. I feel like when it comes to men and women in some of these films, sometimes it feels like someone gets a gun put in their hand and the power surges through their veins and suddenly they know how to use it. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I myself am not very comfortable with guns. I had to learn to shoot one once before for a film and, um, uh, and once went on a inexplicable date with someone who took me to a shooting range. It's a whole story for another time. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the one date thing. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'm not super comfortable with guns. And I think most people aren't. You know, if you didn't grow up around guns or, you know, or, or have them around you in your house or, you know, whatever, it's not something that a lot of people are comfortable with. And Jean is someone who has never been around guns. And I appreciate I appreciate so much the opportunity to watch her be bad at it, to watch her be nervous, to watch her, and there was not a lot of acting involved in this moment, <laughs> but, um, you know, shoot the gun for the first time and it scare her that we're allowed to use that on screen felt, uh, felt really different. I don't think I, I don't think I had really seen that journey in a genre like this. And I appreciated that, you know, the, I think art says so beautifully, you know, what matters is when you really have to use it. Um, that in the moment when she really has to use it, she does, and she does so with the confidence that changes her. Um, but up until that point, it's not such smooth sailing. <laughs> um, our very last question, because we have to wrap this up, this is going to be a fun one. Speaking of intimidation, Rachel, was it intimidating to cover Aretha Franklin and Carol King in the film? And the back of vocals. You, you had to do both. <laughs> yes, I'm horrified. <laughs> um, thankfully, and maybe this is just self-preservation, but we had had some conversation. Julie and I had had a, a number of conversations about 
what Jean's voice sounded like, and, and that was something that was very important to me to try to figure out how someone who, um, who maybe doesn't use their voice very often uh, and, and certainly doesn't necessarily have the confidence in it, what that sounds like when they speak and also when they sing. Um, so uh, there was some pressure removed <laughs> from the decision that, that Jean would not be a very good or confident singer. <laughs> but man, that's one of the greatest songs and one of the greatest covers of all time. And I feel honored to have been able to sing one second of it. And so, so grateful that it's in this film. It feels like the perfect song for this movie. And, you know, it, it means so many different things things in this film and um and I know Julie loves this song so deeply as well but uh oh sorry <laughs> <laughs> well to close well, it out it's, it's, the, it's the thing of like my like my sons like all they want to do I am the world's worst singer right and they love my my singing voice is right. their favorite thing in the world and it's like that's ultimately the you know it's like Harry, that, it, it makes Harry laugh like he loves it and it's like it's the you feed your family then you're the world's most wonderful chef like that's the, the greatest lesson of motherhood is that like you know I'll feel like the worst mom I'll feel like I've had like the worst mom day of my life and my son will just look at me and say you're the best mom in the whole world I'm just like well then there you go that's all that matters I was gonna ask another question but let's be honest that was perfect so <laughs> Thank you guys all so much for talking about this film with us. I know, and thank you also for giving us so many of your questions. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to them all, um, but you can also find everyone on social media. And please um, tell all of your friends and fam um, if they have not yet checked out I'm Your Woman. It is now available um, on Amazon Prime Video. So thank, thank you so much, Angelique. Thank you, Angelique. So good to talk thank to you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone.